is manual vacuum aspiration, how does it work? It is a 15 milliliter syringe attached to this thing on like a straw, a flexible plastic um, cannula. And you expose the, 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 you put a machine, you put some speculum so you can see the cervix. You pass the tube uh, into the uterus until you feel you're hitting us fundus, and then you the vacuum draws the placenta and embryo and blood and everything out of the uterus. You may have to do it twice. Um, you say you can do it with a local anesthetic or sometimes with no anesthetic. It takes about five minutes. Um, it's also useful after a spontaneous abortion because there is a risk of perceptual tissue left and then you can get an infection which will be very serious so you have to, to do that. We've had an unsafe abortion. You need to make sure that everything is removed from the uterus. saying our group is pro-contraception and we think it should be easy common ground for the reasons just described. Um, but I do work with a lot of different kinds of pro-life people and I think I, it's fair for me to speak for them in this situation. There's, in my mind, there are three reasons they end up being against it. Not Different people have different combinations of these, but there's always one of these three reasons. The first one is um, they think a lot of contraceptive methods are basically abortions. So if you argue that the, the human is valuable from zygote on, there's a contraceptive method that prevents implantation, they see that as equally problematic. Um, our group doesn't take that stance because in our understanding of the literature of the vast majority of most common forms of contraception, we don't even think that that happens anyway. And there's other, I don't think I have time in this answer, but there's also other factors to that that we think still makes it not, not the same, but um, that's the first reason. The second reason is it doesn't really directly have to do with the abortion debate, but there's a lot of concern about other side effects of contraception, especially hormonal contraception. Personally, I feel like that's a totally different topic, but I hear it get brought up a lot. Um, and then the third reason, this is important to understand, and this is very common, they do not believe that contraception decreases the overall abortion rate. And I know that sounds totally counterintuitive, but I'll explain why they think that. They basically think that, okay, in a given instance of procreative sex, if you're using contraception, you're less likely to get pregnant than if you're not. I don't think there's a lot of people arguing about that. The question is, if you're using contraception, do you still have the exact same sex life than if you weren't? And the idea is that when you have access to contraception, maybe you think you're using it correctly when you're not, Maybe you think it's more protective than it is, and so you have more procreative sex more frequently, thinking there's a greater protective effect than there is. And so while each instance is safer because you're using some form of contraception, the overall number of instances negates it. I don't know if that makes sense. But that's the argument they make. And, and you've probably heard this before, where they think that when you increase access to contraception, you'll actually increase um, risky sex, in a sense. And so they don't believe that it works. Although in my opinion, I think the abortifacient factor is probably the one that, the one where they believe that contraception causes abortions, that's probably the one that gets brought up the most often. So those are the three reasons. They think that they're, they're worried about side effects of certain kinds of contraception. They don't believe contraception actually decreases abortion rates. And especially they believe that certain types of contraception cause abortions, and so they're not okay with it. Again, speaking for other people, not me, secular pro-life is pro-contraception because we think that it does decrease abortion rates and as far as the side effects that's up to each individual woman you can decide you want to do that or not but it's not really related directly to the debate that makes sense if there are no questions we're going to move to another question Ms. okay so this question is kind of long 
wrong, so feel free to stop me if it gets confusing. But in this person's gender and women's study course, they discussed how many of the bio biology textbooks function as propaganda for capitalism and heteronormative normative regimes by humanizing and gendering sex cells. This class argues that the wording of these texts, about the biology textbooks, from the 90s makes a human life appear as a person to encourage pair bonding and marriage in order to benefit capitalism. Capitalism is benefit, benefited by the creation of a, of a family structure that upholds the status quo and by the creation of a new workforce. Would you say that these texts are free of biases? Can't the writer unintentionally word things that propel their biases? Are these texts objective or do they hold biases in reproductive time? <laughs> <laughs> That's the most feminine question or comment I've ever heard on this campus. You've probably known more people who've written. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I read sort of that, a, a variation that I a comment or on on that question, which is, I don't. Thank you both for sort of holding space so that we can do this on this campus because it's so rare and it's so necessary. Um, I have a hard time thinking about any of this without thinking about patriarchy, and, and sort of thinking about Dr. Potts's. You know, sort of my experiences that I'm Canadian, many friends who you know, access to abortion, such so it's very different issues and just in Canada versus the US. I moved to the US at age 30 and, and sort of until this touched me when I had a plan B prescription from my physician and I had a pharmacist deny me, a very grown up woman, uh, and it had nothing to do with any of this. This was this, ver this, this older man ex exerting authority over, uh, autonomy over my body and I have a hard time thinking about anybody other than a mother, right, sort of in, in, in both of your framings of be, being the, the highest authority to make these decisions. Um, and, and that can go in both directions, right? And so I, buy I, I, I hear what both of you are saying and, and sort of to sort of absolve, to, 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 to make this a legal case, which is the culture that we, the society that we live in, but I defer to, I would defer to the mother who has the ultimate autonomy over her body. And, and if men carried children, we would not be having this debate. So we said in Parliament, if the British Parliament was a Parliament of Mothers instead of a Mother of Parliaments, mm -hmm. we would have passed the law. But that's, can I use that, to, Monica? What we need to talk about, I think, because a lot of things we agree on, is what should the law say? My experience is once a woman wants an abortion, there's no way of stopping her. Making it illegal does not stop abortions. So we, I, I would say again, that I think we could save most of those six million, those 26 million, uh, 26,000 women who die in Africa every year, we could save their lives if we change the laws. Why don't we do that? Yeah, so I, I'm sorry to kind of gloss over the, the two questions that just happened, um, but as far as the law, first I would, I would respectfully and slightly disagree. I, I agree that no law is going to eliminate abortion. I don't think that that's possible. Um, I don't think most laws eliminate any of the actions they outlaw, and so that's something you have to consider. If it's still going to be happening, what does that mean? I don't agree that they make no difference, though, um, especially in the United States, which is the stuff I mostly cover more so than internationally. I have actually seen an extraordinary amount of data suggesting that even, even, not even restrictions like outlawing, but things like funding limitations or parental notification have an effect not just on the abortion rate, but on the fertility rate. Um, so I, I, just want to point out, I don't totally agree about the law, but I do agree that um, there are things we can do to make things safer either way. Like we agree on contraception, and I think one of, one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons that the mortality rate is so bad in other areas is also has to do with limited access to contraception. Um, I think preventing unplanned pregnancies in the first place should be easy, common ground. I think other easy, common ground should be increasing resources for, because it's no secret that there are a lot of people who seek abortions not because they just don't want any children ever for any reason, but because in this particular circumstance and phase in their life, it is just does not seem tenable. And that is a shame because that's not, that's not really like a, a free choice. It's not like choosing between, you know, what you're going to have for dinner or something. It's a very coerced choice. So I think that there should be easy common ground in preventing unplanned pregnancy, easy common ground in when there is an unintended pregnancy that maybe is one to bit difficult, finding resources for that. And as far as what the law should actually say, and this gets 
this gets complicated, and I get, I get a lot of flack for this from my own side sometimes. But I think that because of the complications between these dire situations that women find themselves in, I think often under duress, and the views I just outlined about how that doesn't mean that the fetus is irrelevant and doesn't merit any protection, I think there should be laws and they should have a pretty light touch. You talked about that law in Texas. At least in the circles I run in in the pro-life movement, that law in Texas is reviled. And the people I know hate that that guy brought that up at all. It doesn't go with, in my experience, I didn't do a poll or anything, it doesn't go with mainstream pro-life ideology at all. Um, I think it could be more common ground than people realize in terms of empathy and in terms of actually caring about the women going through this. I mean, it's very clear that your position comes from a great amount of empathy. Um, and I think that that... Did I answer your question? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, in my opinion, the law should say that most abortions should be illegal, but the penalties for it should be a very light touch. And I believe that because of two reasons. The first one is that if you see it the way that I do, which is the idea that it's a that abortion is a human rights violation, if you see it that way, I think there's something to be said for it in itself stating that unequivocally in our culture and offering some kind of protection that way. But the second reason is, again, from the research I've seen, making it illegal does decrease it. And it also actually, at least in the United States, it decreases um, pregnancy rates in an indirect way too. Guttmacher just recently, in the last couple of years, had a, had a study come out where they found that women who live in states especially hostile to abortion are significantly more likely to use contraception and to use highly effective contraception. The idea being that, well, frankly, they would have less options if they had an unintended pregnancy and they're taking more care to make sure that does not happen. I'm not saying that's the, the gentlest way to go about it, but it, it, they're all connected. So I do think the law should say that most abortions should be illegal, but the penalty should be light. They should not focus on the woman, in my opinion. and. Uh, we should focus a lot more, in conjunction or perhaps prior to that, on the contraception access and especially the social support, so that it doesn't become such an issue in the first place. What would a light penalty look like? I think a light, I think the lightest penalty would be a fine or revocation of license for the practitioner who breaks the law. That's what I think. Probably. But if you do that, then many will turn to unsafe abortions and die. I think that that, I think to be blunt that that is grossly exaggerated, I do. I'm not trying to be glib. I'll give you the example of New York, which seems to me to show that when you change the law, you actually have fewer abortions. I do not agree with your interpretation of the data for New York. No, it's there. I mean, whatever. Because it, I agree with... You could assume everybody became a homosexual and they had less sex or something no. other. But the most likely explanation is they continued their sexual practices as previously, but they used contraception better and they had less abortions. No, there's actually a lot of research to show that when you change the abortion law, people don't continue their sexual practices as previously. And there's a lot of conflation between the changes in contraception and abortion. I agree, obviously, that you show the data that show that the number of abortions increased a lot and the and the births decreased, but not by the same magnitude. But my interpretation of that data, and I'd have to look at that specific study to see, but it would dovetail with the other studies that I've read, is that it wasn't just that illegal um, off the books abortions were now on the books. It was also that abortion increased substantially because it was legal and more easily accessible. The abortion rate is definitely affected by how legal and accessible it is overall. And so is the pregnancy rate. But when they do research that looks at not abortion rates, because you can always wonder, well, are they capturing the illegal abortions or not? That's always going to be a problem. But when you do research that looks at the changes in abortion laws and fertility rates, it shows the same kind of result, where especially when you first change the abortion law, um, the fertility rates go up. All the women who might have otherwise gotten abortions don't. Don't. In fact, you're, are you familiar with um, the Turner White study that they did recently? You probably are more familiar with it than I am. I've only started to read about it. But basically, it's, it's really quite fascinating. They, they, took, they interviewed a whole bunch of women who went to abortion clinics when they were sort of near the limit of what the clinic would, like if a clinic will perform an abortion up to 24 weeks, they were kind of near that limit. So that was one group, and they would get an abortion. And then they looked at women who got to that clinic 
just a little too late. They were beyond the gestational limit, and so the clinic wouldn't perform the abortion and turn them away. It's called the Turnaway Study. And then they're comparing these two groups and their outcomes. Um, it's really good. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Sorry. I'm responsible for the Turnaway Study in a way. <laughs> when I was in Czechoslovakia in 1960, looking at the experience of communist countries with safe abortion, somebody gave me data where they had collected data on 120 women who had been refused an abortion, they had committees to do it, and 120 controls. A friend of mine then followed those for about 40 years, and the one, women who sought, sought abortions, they weren't told why they were being studied, and they were the children, but the children who were born of mothers who sought abortions had, were more likely to be criminals were less likely to go in the army, were more likely to get divorced. A lot of things, sometimes it was the males, sometimes it was females, most of these things were relatively small, and some people did outstandingly well, even though their mothers had some for abortion. But there was a statistically measurable impact on people who wanted an abortion and refused it. And that data by Henry David, David and it was supported by NIH, and it's there in the application. <laughs> So, when we refuse somebody an abortion, we do a thing which we've got to think about the moral impact of that. The woman, I think, is the best person to decide this. Are we going too long? I want to um, love the conversation, but I want to get one more question in since we're pushing on time. Okay. Um, so, what do you think about the moral re relevancy of the mother and her life? I think that when a woman's life is at risk, this is why I keep saying broadly illegal and generally speaking these caveats, because I do think there are exceptions and this should be an easy one. Because I think when a woman's life is at risk, it's justified. It's self-defense. Same thing as if I had a toddler and in some bizarre situation, the only way I could, like, I can't even think of what the situation would be, but let's say that... I'm drowning and the kid is pulling me down too. I mean, it's a horrific idea, but if I save myself, it's still self-defense. It's not the same thing as when you aren't under that kind of duress. And there are certainly situations, the topic of pregnancy being the first foremost that I think of, where a pregnancy is likely to cause that kind of problem. And I think that while it's horribly sad, and I think that people who go through it, it's traumatic, it's still justifiable. That's what I think. So, um, this question, okay, so, do you think that, um, both your experiences as white people affect your belief? Um, abortions and contraceptive care is obviously an intersectional, intersectional issue and should be addressed by this. Do you think that you can, you can take this question of abortion and apply it to the point of view of someone, um, I think that's a really good question to do. I know that in the what I refer to as the mainstream pro-life movement, and by that I mean very politically active. There's a lot of people who do pro-life work in terms of getting resources to women in everyday stuff that don't get that involved in politics. But in terms of the mainstream pro-life uh, movement, in my experience it is disproportionately white. And um, especially, and I know you guys probably haven't seen much of this, but in the secular pro-life movement, it's even more so that way. And I'm well aware of that deficit. I think it's pretty important to talk to um, people of different backgrounds, pro-choice or pro-life, to make sure we're factoring in other issues. And, and it's no secret that <laughs> all reproduction issues affect people of different backgrounds, especially different races in this country, very differently. So, yeah, I think that we could do more to highlight those voices.
how can you impose like your belief system on say like me who doesn't believe in that same system? So if, in case you couldn't hear paraphrasing, the idea is I support a law that would criminalize most abortions, but if someone doesn't share my views about bodily autonomy or fetal work, and they think that bodily rights should supersede the right to life, why should I be able to impose my views and my law onto those people? That's the question, right? Um, it's my perspective that all the laws we have impose our views onto somebody, and I think especially when it comes to, if you view it as a human rights violation, it's hard to argue that we can't impose that. So basically in a democracy, I think it comes down to persuading enough people to see your view or not, and then going with that. That's basically what I think. And I, just as I don't have a problem supporting laws against child abuse or other things that I see as human rights violations, even if someone might see something differently than I do, I'm interested in a conversation about that. I'd like to persuade as many people to see it how I do as possible. But given the realm of influence I have, I will always advocate for laws that I think are going to be, have the greatest protective effect. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that is all the time we have. Thank you both for coming out.